Children's Church. I think most, most of us would know that we can be scammed. If you don't know that, I don't know where you've been living lately. But we can be scammed, but just knowing that we can be scammed doesn't prevent us or keep us from being scammed. Recently, my parents and then my son-in-law's parents spent pr- pretty much the whole day going through a scam and wondering, is this legitimate or not? I mean, the phone call sounds legitimate. The, the email, the stationery looks like it's a legitimate business. The website looks like it's legit, looks like it's all official. And they spent their whole day wondering, is this real or not? And I hate to admit this, but yes, I have been scammed. I guess it was a year or so ago. We were uh, getting some software for my wife's computer. And so I went online to buy some software for that so she'd have what she needed. And the purchase went through, everything looked legitimate. And then I had to make another purchase for this software and so I gave him my credit card information, right? It looked like it was a legitimate company, and it was only $130, say only. Well, I found out it, it was a scam. They, they took my money, and they said, well, you know, you, re- you really need us to provide now technical support to get all this set up, and how much is that going to be? Well, probably three or $400, you know. And I realized, you know what? This is a scam. And I said, I'd like my money back, and click. <laughs> So just knowing that you can be scammed doesn't necessarily prevent you from being scammed. I knew I could be scammed. An even far worse scam than that is somebody who comes along and scams your faith. And that's what Jude is warning us about. If you have your Bibles, let's turn to Jude. We're going to start today in Jude verse 4. And he's exposing the danger that we face of these scam artists, these spiritual scam artists. He's talking about these people who are a threat to your faith, who can undermine your faith. So he exhorts us in verse 4, for certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designed for this condemnation. Ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. They crept in unnoticed. They, They weren't aware of the danger that they were in. They weren't aware that these people who had come into their church could undermine their faith. I mean, isn't everybody welcome in church? I mean, just come as you are. Everybody should be in church, right? Well, there are certain people, he's saying, that really shouldn't be in the church because these are people who can actually harm your faith. So he's exposing them. He says they they crept in unnoticed. So they were not part of the original group of believers in this church. They came in after it had already started, and they crept in like, you don't really know who we are. I mean, they didn't want people to know who they were. Their, their true identity, their true intentions of what they wanted to do in this church, they came in and they looked like every other believer. They looked like they were safe and they were, they were fine. There would be no problems with these new people. We're glad to have new people in our church. But they didn't realize that these, these new people, they had another agenda. And the agenda was to undermine their faith. Their agenda was to lead them into a different type of Christianity that is not true biblical Christianity. And so he's warning them. They've slipped in without you noticing it. They've slipped in underneath the radar. And they are a problem. And they are sneaky, so you didn't realize it. So he says, who long ago were designated for this condemnation. So this hasn't caught God by surprise. Long ago, God knew that this was going to happen. I think this is referring to the Old Testament. So he gives us some examples to follow that show what happens when we listen to people like this who are dangerous to our faith. But before he does that, he describes who these people are. He calls them ungodly people. Now, as I said, they were sneaky, so they're not going to outright say there, there is no God. You know, ungodly, no God. No, they wouldn't do that. They wouldn't say there's no God. Of course not. That would be a heretic. That would be blasphemy. 
but they are going to live their lives as if there is no God. They're going to live their lives as if they do not fear God. They do not fear any consequences for their behavior. They're going to live their lives as if they're not accountable to God, as if I don't care if God's pleased with my life or not. What pleases me is how I want to live my life. And he said that they pervert the grace of our God into sensuality. The word pervert here means to change, to, to alternate something so that it's not what it, it should be. It's actually to depart from it. Th these were people that were saying that you can be a Christian, but you don't have to live like you're a Christian. Now, there is a danger for those people who think that they are Christian because they are moral, because they are religious, because maybe they go to church or maybe they don't, but they pray, especially when they have hard times, and, and they think that they are a good person. They think because I'm moral and a decent person, then I am a Christian. But these people weren't like that. The, the, these were the people who said that you are saved by God's grace because they pervert the grace of God. They said we're saved by God's grace. We don't deserve salvation. So we have faith in Christ. But once we become a Christian, then we don't have to live like we're Christians. That we have this orientation now that we're supposed to be Christians. That's not what God wants us to do. It's not following after God's will, which God's will for our lives is what? It's holiness to be holy people unto God, separate unto God. But now the purpose of our life, we have God's grace, is, is to live however we want, we want to live. We don't have to be holy. You know, there, there's an expression for that, and it's called cheap grace. Have you ever heard that expression? Cheap grace. God's grace doesn't cost us anything, and it doesn't cost us anything. We receive it as a gift, free, because it costs God everything. But it doesn't expect us to change our lives. It doesn't expect us, it doesn't demand us to live a different kind of life once we become saved. It's a kind of salvation that has no repentance to it. And by the way, a salvation that has no repentance to it is not a true salvation. Because repentance means I am turning away from sin and I am turning to live with Jesus and follow after Jesus. So this is like a salvation that, that saves me to live however I want to live. And that's not the grace of God that has come to us. So he's saying that this is a danger to their faith. And we see this in the next phrase. It says that they deny our Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. They outright denied Jesus Christ. Now, how, how would they do that? If they said, I don't believe in Jesus, would they be allowed to be a part of that church? Function in that church? I don't think so. Remember, these were sneaky people. They, they snuck in unawares that people realized that these are dangerous people. But they denied the Lord. They denied the Lord how? They denied the Lord in the way they lived. That salvation doesn't have any claim on my life, how I live my life. That I can believe in Jesus as my Savior, but I don't have to have all of Jesus. I can just have part of Jesus. I can just have the part of Jesus that forgives me of my sin, but I don't have to have the rest of Jesus who is Lord and who commands my life and tells me how I should live my life. I just want half the Lord. I don't want all the Lord. But this true salvation that the Bible says that we have in Christ Jesus is we receive Christ as Lord and Savior. And when we call him our Lord, what do we mean by that? He is our boss. He is our master. And that's what he says here. The only, the only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. So what is a master in Bible times? A master was someone who had absolute authority and control over a household. When he gave his word, his word was the law. His word was not to be disregarded, ignored, or disobeyed. His word was to be uh, disobeyed. His word was to be followed. Because he was the master. And he says, Jesus is our master and our Lord. So we can see back in verse 1 why Jude would say he, he is a servant or a slave of Jesus Christ. Because he sees Jesus for who he really is. He is the one 
and only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. So this means that our allegiance should be to Christ, that we should be following him, that we should be giving him our love and our devotion, our obedience because of who Jesus is. He is the only Master and Lord. So if you don't see that as your necessary obligation as a Christian, then maybe you're already swerving away from the true faith. You know, the first step of obedience when you receive Christ into your life is the baptism. That's showing that Jesus Christ now has saved me. He has come into my life. He has forgiven me of my sin, and now he is my Lord and my Master. And by being baptized, you're showing that, yes, I'm identified with Jesus in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And now I'm following after Jesus. And if a person doesn't follow the Lord in baptism after they profess salvation in him, if, the, if a person doesn't want to follow after Jesus after they professed, I needed to be saved, I've received Jesus now, and then after that, they don't want to follow Jesus, what do we have to say about that? We have to say, maybe they didn't really get saved. And I think that's what he's saying here. So to impress the danger that they're in, if they listen to these people who have perverted the grace of God into sensuality, that word sensuality means to live without moral restraint, to live however my flesh wants me to live. Those people who, who say this is the way you can live the Christian life and be a good Christian, he's saying if you follow after that, then this is what's going to happen to you. And he gives us three shocking examples. The first one is verse 5 of the Israelites. He says, now I want to remind you. So we need reminders in Scripture. Even though we already know something, if we don't keep getting reminded about it, we're likely to forget it. There's so many important lessons that God wants us to teach us in his word, and we need to be reminded about it. So if you ever hear me repeating myself, well, it could be my old age because I forgot, did I already say that? But it also could be that God wants us to remember these things in his word. So these examples serve as a warning of those who leave from where God put them They don't stay in that place. They don't remain there where God wants them to be. And they leave from there and they go to another place where God had no intention for them to be. So that's the the point of these three examples. So the first one is Israelites. He says, I want to remind you, although you uh, you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. Now notice he doesn't really elaborate on this. He doesn't tell us when God did this with the Israelites. We know when he did deliver them, he delivered them out of slavery in Egypt. Um, Egypt oftentimes in the Old Testament is called the house of bondage or the house of slavery. And this is a really interesting text. I know some of your translations says that, that the Lord delivered them, but this specifically says it was Jesus that delivered them out of slavery. He did it at night, as that picture shows. Passover night. And uh, Israel had been there in slavery for over 400 years. It looked humanly impossible for them to break out of that slavery, uh, to break free from Pharaoh. But God freed them, and their deliverance is really a picture to us of our deliverance out of sin. That sin no longer is master that we when when sin comes and tempts us we do not have to say yes to sin as our master because we've been set free out of the slavery of that but though he delivered them out of the land of Egypt afterward it says he destroyed those who did not believe what a shocking statement they started out so well they were delivered out of that bondage and they were on their way en route to the promised land where God was going to give them a land inheritance They'd have their freedom. They'd have a place to enjoy their lives with their families and grow their own food and live the lives that God wanted them to live. And yet, before they got there, it says they were destroyed. Why? It says because they did not believe. Now, I assume the story takes place in Numbers chapter 14. You can go back and look at that later. 
But in Numbers chapter 14, when the 12 scouts returned from spying out the land of Canaan, the promised land, they came back and they said, yes, it's a good land the way God said it is, but there's a problem there. There's giants that live there. These, there's these fortified, strong-walled cities that we'll never be able to overcome. If we go in there, it will be a mission of death. There's no way we'll get out alive. Now, there was a minority report, you remember, from Joshua and Caleb. They said, no, this is God's promise to us. He's given us this land. He will give us the victory. But regardless of that, the people thought that we are on a mission of death. They said, how could the Lord do this to us and bringing us to a land where we are going to die by the sword and our wives and children will become prey to our enemies? And so they chose to decide, we need a new leader. Moses is going to lead us in there. It will not be good. We need a new leader to take us back to Egypt, back to slavery. And they did not believe that God would take them in there and give them victory. And so, so what happened? Well, we know what happened. The Lord said, uh, I'm, I'm going to destroy them. And Moses interceded to the Lord. The, Moses said, no. What will people say that you couldn't bring them in there because you're too weak of a God? That will be dishonoring to your name. So he pleaded with the Lord as an as a advocate, as an intercessor, as a mediator. And the Lord said, okay, okay, I will not destroy them now. I will destroy the, the ten spies who had a negative testimony who did not believe me and turned the people away from me. Uh, and these who are age 20 and older, they will wander in the wilderness for 40 years until the last one dies. But they are going to be destroyed. And so Israel, at this point, those who are age 20 and older did not go into the promised land because they did not believe God at this point. But Caleb and Joshua were allowed to go in because they believed in the Lord. So the warning is this. If you do not continue to stay in that place where God puts you, that place of faith and trusting God, depending upon Him, and you depart from that, it's not going to go well for you. You may be destroyed as well if you do not persevere in the faith. Now the second example he gives in verse 6 is kind of a strange story. And we're not going to go back and look in Genesis chapter 6. You can go back and read that later. But this is of the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling. So again, he doesn't say when this example happened. We don't know if he's referring to when Lucifer, uh, the devil in heaven, rebelled against God and led a third of the other angels to join him in that, trying to overthrow God, or if it refers to the story that I mentioned to you in Genesis chapter 6. So these angels he's talking about, they did not stay within their own position. So the Jewish interpretation of that story in Genesis chapter 6, the, it's called the sons of God. They're referred to as angels. Sometimes in scripture, uh, specifically in the book of Job, angels are called the sons of God. And they left their place where God put them and they decided to take on human form because they had that power, and they were attracted to these women, and they wanted to be with those women, and from that relationship came this offspring of these giants, of these mighty men upon the earth. And the next thing we read after that happens is that the earth was filled with violence. The earth became so bad that God says, I'm going to have to destroy the world with a flood. Do you remember that story? So he's saying these angels that did that, they rebelled against God. They left their assigned place. They went and they did what they shouldn't have done. He says, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. So God judged their disobedience. God put them in custody where they're at right now. You say, where, where is this place he's talking about, this gloomy darkness? Well, Second Peter talks about that they are in hell right now. Not all the demons, not all the fallen angels are there, but these angels that did that, he's talking about, they're in custody right now waiting for the final great day of judgment before God. And then the last example he gives us in verse 7 is the example of Sodom and Gomorrah. He says, Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality, 
and pursued a natural desire serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Now one reason to take the interpretation I just gave, and I re realize that it's kind of, it seems like far-fetched to think of fallen angels, demonic spirits, evil beings, to be able to take human form and then procreate with women. You say, because it says in the Bible, angels cannot, they're not like married in heaven and have children in heaven. So you say, well, why, why would you take the interpretation that these demonic spirits could take on human form and have children. So we assume that when they take on human form, they have human capacity like we do to procreate. And the reason why that makes sense is because he's saying in the same way, likewise, they indulge in sexual immorality. So Sodom and Gomorrah, he's going to talk about sexual immorality. He's saying in the same way, the same way as what? As these fallen angels did in the, in the, in the first in the example that we just looked at in verse 6. So this story that he's referring to now about Sodom and Gomorrah, it's found in Genesis chapter 19. And we learn that the, the men of these cities were given over to sexual immorality, namely the sin of homosexuality. This, this wickedness that they had, he calls it an unnatural desire of men wanting to be with men instead of with women. The sexual immorality, they went after other flesh that they were not supposed to be with, he says in this verse. So I believe that the demonic spirits there in verse 6 did the very same thing. Not the sin of homosexuality, but the sin of not being with the flesh, the women that they should not have been with. So what happened to, to these two cities of Sodom and Gomorrah? He says, well, they serve as an example. Punishment of eternal fire. So in that story in, in Genesis chapter 19... It says that the Lord God rained down fire, sulfur and fire from heaven upon those two cities and wiped them out because of their sin. Sin of homosexuality, the sin of sexual immorality. Wiped them out completely. You say, well, that was just a story. I don't know that it really happened. Well, if we traveled over to Palestine, south of the Dead Sea is where scholars, archaeologists believe that these cities were located and over there is still scorched earth. Jonathan Edwards in one of his sermons described the terrible scene that that must have been. As these cities were full of fire, he says, in their houses there was no safety for they were all on fire. And if they fled out into the streets, they also were full of fire. Fire continually came down out of heaven everywhere. What a cry was then in that city and every part of it. But there was none to help. They had nowhere to go where they could hide their heads from fire. So the judgment that God sent upon Sodom and Gomorrah for their, their wickedness was an example for everyone that follows afterwards to realize what God thinks about that and how God will judge that. And one day he says there will be this eternal fire of judgment upon that sin. So these are hard examples to listen to, and I get that, especially in the day and age that we live in, a day of pluralism, a day when we have multiple faiths and, and multiple options, and we shouldn't say one is not good, you know, mine is better than yours, or mine is a little bit better than yours. We should, we should say all religious faiths, all beliefs, all types of lifestyle are acceptable today. It's like you, you cannot judge people today. You cannot say we live in a no judgment zone, you know, no, no judgment allowed. You, you can't do that today. We live in a time of toleration. You have to tolerate. And we see this today in so many ways. Um, I just noticed in the news this past week that Pope Francis is embarking on a 12-day trip through four nations in Southeast Asia and Oceania. And the intent of his voyage is to pledge the Catholic Church will combat religious violence while inspiring stronger ties to other religions. So this Thursday, this past week, the Associated Press reported that the Pope made his first stop on this 12-day trip in Jakarta, Indonesia. It's actually home to the largest uh, Muslim population in, in the world. I think like 99% of Indonesia is Muslim. And the Pope met with the Grand Imam of Indonesia at the Tunnel of Friendship that 
connects the, the great mosque there to a Catholic church. And so they were there at that, that intersection, at that tunnel. And he said, and I quote, have, he said, the religions have a role to play in helping everyone pass through the tunnels of life with their eyes turned towards the light. Speaking to this audience alongside the imam, he said, through, through the translator, of course, I encourage you to continue along this path so that all of us, all of us together, each cultivating his or her own spirituality and practicing his or her religion may walk in search of God and contribute to building open societies. So while he doesn't say it outright, I mean, he's implying that all faiths, all religions are legitimate and are helping us in our search and our pathway to God. That's the, the world that we live in today, religious pluralism, that the Christian faith is not the only true religion in the world. There are other religions, and they're viable, and we shouldn't judge people who are in those religions. They're in that tunnel, too, that's leading to the light. You know, today we, we live not just in religious pl pluralism, but we also live in this moral relativism where all behaviors, all lifestyles are okay. Uh, we can't say that a person acting out in this way is immoral and a person uh, being with, with another person of the, the same gender is immoral, that people who are living together who are not married, that that's wrong. We, we live in a world that says, no, we have our freedom to live however we want to live. It's moral relativism, and we cannot judge other people. We cannot say that they're wrong in doing that. Well, what would you say about that? I think this is one reason why Jude, it, Jude is not a popular book. It's, it's a neglected book because these are messages that we don't like to hear. It sounds like it's not even Christian to say, well, well God has eternal fire of judgment that he's going to rain down upon some people and, and that God is going to deal with sin. We, we live in a world that doesn't like to hear that. And yet Jude would tell us that there is a, a true faith system. There is a true right and wrong moral way of living your life. And if we're not living our lives that way, then what can we expect? We can expect the same thing to happen to us as happened to these examples that he just gave us. That if we leave that place where God has called us to be and that, that belief in the Lord or that the way God wants us to live... And we say it doesn't matter anymore. We can, we can believe over here. We can live over here. It doesn't matter anymore. He says it does matter. It's going to be a terrible ending for you. If you don't continue living the life of faith the way God has called you to live, that there are these absolute moral standards or these absolute ways to believe. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He didn't say, I am a way, one of among many. He says, no, I am the way and the only way. And unless somebody comes through me in their faith, they're not going to get to the Father in heaven. Unless somebody follows after me, he says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them. And they follow me. If we are not following Jesus, remaining with him, living the way he wants us to live, you, if we're supposed to be like Jesus and following his example, do you think he's going to have an example of sin? Absolutely not. And if we're not living the way he's called us to live our lives, we're not going to end up where God wants us to be. So what kind of people are these who are negatively influencing them? We, we see in verse 8 where he goes back to describing these people. He says, yet in like manner... These people, he calls them these people. Now, these people obviously had names. These people obviously sat in a place in that church. They had, they had their location there. But he calls them these people throughout. He said, these people also, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. So he says, they're not under God's authority. Instead, they're relying on their dreams. So where do these false teachers get their ideas? Where, where do they get their, their guidance from? He says it's from their dreams. Why do they advocate for believers that it's okay to live in sin? You can have Jesus as your Savior, but you don't have to take him as your Lord. Where do they get that idea? 
He says they get it from their dreams. Rather than from the once for all faith delivered to the saints back in verse 3, they thought, God is giving me my dreams. After all, we have many examples in Scripture of people that God gave a vision to or God gave a dream to, and he spoke to them through that dream. And through that dream, he showed them what he wanted to do. So these that crept into the church, they were having these dreams. Do you ever have dreams? I'm told if you don't, if you don't dream, it's not a good thing, and you're going to go wacko, right? Right? But they were having their dreams, and they were having the kind of dreams that were very sensual, that were way out of bounds of where they should have been. And they were thinking that, well, God is directing me through those dreams that this is how I should live my life. That's where they were doing it. Now, if these people were so dangerous to the believers at the church, they could undermine their faith. They could lead them into an alternate kind of Christianity that was not true biblical Christianity. Why were they there in the first place? Why did God let these people end up in that church? That's a good question. Doesn't God care about his sheep? Doesn't God want to protect his sheep from, from that kind of negative influence from false teachers? Here's the verse the Lord led me to in Deuteronomy chapter 13. Verses 1 to 3, if a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and here's the key, and the sign or wonder that he tells you comes to pass, and if he says, let us go after other gods which you have not known, and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your souls. So the, the answer to the question I just asked you, why would God let people like that, false teachers, come creep into the church, be sneaky about it, and cloak over their true intentions of how they want to lead these believers into sensuality and sin? Why would God allow that to happen? Why would God allow these people who are having these dreams, thinking it's from God, and these dreams are being fulfilled, that God is, he is leading me, he is showing me how to live my life, and it's okay to be this way. Why would God let that happen? And this verse in, in Deuteronomy says, the Lord your God is testing you. God is allowing these people around you, and you're hearing these people because he's testing your faith. Will you persevere in your faith? Will you show your love for the Lord by saying to these people, you know what, you're nuts, get lost. I don't think you should be here. I think that maybe there's another place for you, but it's not here. Because you're, you're teaching false doctrine. This is not the way the Lord has called us to live. So the Lord allows that to test us. Where are you in your faith? What, will you base your faith on the word of God? You let God guide you through his truth that he's given us in his word? Or will you base it on this sub subjectivism, on your dreams? Where would you be if you followed some of your dreams? I'm not talking about like you're daydreaming of I want to be a great person, I want to be all this. I'm talking about the dreams that come to you at night. You think that's a very vulnerable time for us because you're not alert and you're not able to say, you know what, that's a wrong thought. I shouldn't be thinking about that. I shouldn't be in that dream doing that. No, I am not going to do that. You're not able to do that when you're dreaming because that's all of your subconscious working and your conscious is not able to take control of that. And it's also a vulnerable time in your life because guess who else can show up and give you dreams? You say, yeah, the Lord can do that for us. I'm not saying God doesn't do dreams. I'm not saying that. He can. I'm not assuming that he is, though. Who else can show up in our dreams? The devil can show up in our dreams. You know that story we told last week of Steve Berger, Pastor Steve, in the Calvary Chapel Church. Uh, their son died in a tragic car accident at age 19, and then he thought his son was coming back from heaven to minister to him. And he said that Josiah, the name of his son, appears to people in their dreams, and he talks to people in their dreams. Interesting thing I didn't tell you about that story. The assistant pastor, who before when they started the prayer service, heard Josiah apparently whisper in his ear, 
I'm here to worship with you. And then he really thought that this pastor's deceased son had come back from heaven to be a part of their worship service and their prayer service. He really thought he was there, and they were so encouraged by that, he realized later that they were deceived, and that was a demonic, evil spirit that was impersonating Josiah to deceive that church and lead that church into an alternate type of Christianity. You see, the devil can come to us in our dreams, and he can inspire us to do things that God does not want And so when a person begins to rely upon their dreams, say, this is how God guides me. I'm not, again, saying God can't guide a person that way. But I would say normally God is guiding us through his word. And a person who is now depending upon their dreams for guidance from God is in dangerous territory. Because we see that from from these people that were doing that. What happens to them? Those who are relying on their dreams. He says they defile the flesh. Before God, they are unclean. They're unfit to be with God. They're unfit to have God's favor. They they are toxic spiritually. People that get around them will be contaminated. They will become defiled. Actually, they will be stained, permanently stained by these people. And then he says they reject authority. This ties back to verse 4 where they deny the lordship of Jesus Christ as their master and lord. They, they will have none of that. They will, they will only have themselves as their Lord and their master. Their sensual desires is what they will do. That is what they are going to obey. And then he says, this is interesting, they blaspheme the glorious ones. It's not clear who the glorious ones are in this text. But given the context, I would say he's referring to angels. He's already talked about angels back in verse 6. And we know that in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, it was the angels that came down, the good angels that came down to warn Lot and his family about fleeing from the city and not looking back. So I think he's talking about angels here. I think he's talking about fallen angels. You say, wait a minute. How could fallen angels, how could he like blaspheme glorious? Why would he call demons glorious ones? And I think the idea would be that they are saying about demons that they have no power over us. They have no effect. They cannot wreck our lives. They cannot hurt us. We don't have to worry about what they can do to us. Their glory of demons would be that they're able to wreck people's lives. That they're able to tempt people and deceive people and ruin their lives. That's their glory is in their destructive power. And and they're, they're talking about them in ways that we are immune to these demonic spirits. We don't have to worry about them. We're better than that. And then he gives this story in verse 9 that just seems so out of place. It's like, why would he even bring it up? But he's actually illustrating what he just said. But when the archangel Michael, a contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. So he said, I've never read that story. Where where does it come from? It's the non-canonical book, The Assumption of Moses. And the story apparently took place after the death of Moses. You remember Moses went up to to Mount Nebo to look over into the promised land. He wasn't allowed to go in because of his sin. He disobeyed the Lord. So the Lord says, I will let you look at the promised land and then you will die. He died there by himself. So the Lord called his highest angel, the archangel Michael, to go and give Moses a proper burial. Apparently the Jews believed that before they could have a safe passage into the next life, they had to have a proper burial. So Michael comes down to do this burial and guess who shows up? The devil is there. And the devil is arguing with Michael. No, you can't bury him. No, it's not going to be a proper honorable burial because Moses was a murderer. He doesn't deserve a proper burial. He murdered that Egyptian. The devil is called what? Of the, of the, of the brethren. The accuser of the brethren. That's one of his titles in Revelation. He is the accuser of believers. You have been forgiven by the Lord. You should have favor and fellowship with the Lord. You should be able to walk in the blessing of the Lord in your life. And what does the devil do? He comes and he accuses you in your conscience. He accuses you. You should feel guilty about that. No, God hasn't forgiven. You don't feel guilt. You don't, you don't feel forgiven of that. 
You should feel guilty about that. You should feel like a loser. You can't do anything for God. That's the devil. He's the accuser. He's the accuser. And that's what he's doing here. He is, he is accusing Moses of that thing that God forgave Moses for. And God went on to use the life of Moses as his great servant. And yet the devil is arguing and fighting back and forth. And so what does Michael do? Well, well Michael had the authority to carry out the burial. Michael had the authority over the devil to rebuke the devil and say, get in your place where you belong. Leave me alone. But notice he doesn't do that. He doesn't step out of the place where God put him, the authority that God gave him. He remains in that authority under God's authority, and he turns it back to the, to the Lord. He says, the Lord rebuke you. The Lord, that's the Lord's place. That's the Lord's prerogative is to rebuke you, not me. So how does that play out with these false teachers? Well, verse 10, but these people... That's what he's talking about, verse 8, verse 4. These people, certain people, these false teachers, who have subverted the grace of God for sensuality, in contrast with Michael, who understands how evil the devil is and how the devil is judged and where the devil should go, and he, he could have given the devil the riot act, but he doesn't. He said, the Lord rebuke you, but the, the false teachers, they don't understand that. They are speaking evil, blasphemy against these, these demonic beings, and they don't even understand what they're doing, he's saying. And this is so, I mean, it's like, wow. You can't think about people this way, but he does. He says what they understand is they are like unreasoning animals. They understand instinctively. So what they do understand is their natural instinct for, for sensuality, for fleshly living, for immorality, for living with my flesh in control. That's what they understand. Just like an animal lives by their instincts, he says these people live by their fleshly instincts. He will tell us as we get over to verse 19 and verse 20 that these are worldly people. They are devoid of the Spirit. And my friend, if you do not have the Holy Spirit, you do not have Jesus Christ living inside of you. These are unsaved people these are people who have come in to undermine their true faith, to subvert their true Christianity and lead them to an alternate kind of Christianity that says you can live however you want to live. You don't have to follow Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So he's warning us. He's giving us, uh, he's giving us examples. He's telling us these are the kind of people you don't want to be with because this is what will happen to you if you follow these people. You have to contend. You have to defend your faith. If you don't defend your faith, you may end up like you don't want to end up. Let's pray. Father, we know that you are, are loving and kind. Lord, that you are altogether just. Lord, a message like this is not the kind of message that we would like to hear, but yet we know it's one that we need to hear. Because if we don't take this seriously, we could be led astray. We could be deceived. We could be scammed. We could have taken from us the most precious thing, Lord, our faith in you, so that we don't continue to follow you like we should. Father, that's not what we want. And maybe, Lord, there's some today that's listening to this that have already strayed and fallen away. We pray that you might awaken them, Lord, to the danger that they're in, that they might come back to you. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.